Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So today we will start a new topic, the last topic in, in finding the force response in statically determinate structures. It's called influence lines. So in this book on structural analysis, that will be the end of part two, force response in statically determinate structures, after which we will move to part three, which is displacement response in statically determinate structures. So we are here. We finish these topics and we <coughs> begin by asking a question whose answer you should know. What is an influence line? <coughs> an influence line, as the word suggests, is a line which shows the influence of some parameter on what? On some response function. Which response function? <coughs> it could be any response function of your choice. It could be a support reaction, it could be a, a bending moment at a section in a beam, it could be the shear force, it could be the actual force in a truss member. Uh, <clears throat> in what way is the influence line diagram different from a bending moment diagram? Yes. So in the bending moment diagram, you are saying the it's for a given loading diagram where the load is fixed, whereas we have heard that the influence line diagram uh, deals with a moving load whose position can shift from point to point. That's one difference. But more important, yes, this is important. In your interviews, they'll begin with simple questions like this. Yes. A bending moment diagram gives you bending moments at all possible sections in a beam. The influence line diagram for bending moment is at a particular section. Could be a mid-span section or a quarter-span section or a support section. So you have to be clear. It doesn't give you the bending moments at all sections in a beam. You're looking at only one particular section. So. It's important to know all these basics. And one common assumption we make is that uh, you don't need to worry about deflections. You can treat these as rigid bodies because you're looking only at the statics. But at the same time, we did look at the deflected shapes and so on. So these are the topics we will cover quickly. We won't go too much in depth because uh, because it can be quite involved. Okay, so we'll go through the basic principles. So the definition of an influence line diagram. An influence line diagram, or simply influence line, is a graph which depicts the variation of a particular force response function. You can choose your function, such as a support reaction or an internal force at a given section. Internal force could be a bending moment, for example, here you have a continuous beam and let's say you're interested in the bending moment at the section F. And we're going to draw the influence line diagram here uh, for different positions of a unit concentrated load on the span of a structure. Um, so later we'll see the utility of this, but you have a unit load. And some people put this under the topic of moving loads. That's not a correct use 
of the word because moving will always involve some dynamics. We are not doing any dynamics here. It's all statics. So these are different static positions of the same load. Let's say the load is here. Then I will draw the bending moment at F here. Of course, uh, you know the bending moment there will be zero. Wherever this unit load is, bending moment here will always be zero, bending moment here will always be zero. At the supports, uh, at B it won't be zero because it's continuous, but at the two ends it will be zero. Right? Now, how will you draw the, uh, the influence line for bending moment at F? Can you guess? Well, it will be if the load, unit load is located here, what do you think the bending moment at F will be? It will be zero because, you know, it's, uh, the load is going straight to the support. So you can argue, think, uh, and break your head and plot for all the points. But is there a simple way of drawing this bending moment, this influence line diagram? And what is it? There's a very beautiful way you can qualitatively draw the influence line diagram. Do you know how to do it? Yes? What should I do to draw this diagram? Which principle should I invoke? Very good. Mueller Brislow's principle. What does it involve? I introduce a hinge here. I release the bending moment there. And then what do I do? I give a unit rotation and, and draw the deflected shape. Whatever shape I get is the influence line diagram qualitatively. And if that rotation is actually exactly equal to 1, that is my influence line diagram. It's a very powerful principle. So imagine you put an internal hinge there and you move it either up or down. It doesn't matter. So if you do that, let's say I move it up. And if I move it up, then I have relative rotation here. Whatever shape I get, you can intuitively draw the shape. This has to come back to the support and go back to the support and go back there, right? And qualitatively, this is your influence line diagram. This means the maximum bending moment at F I will get when the unit load is placed at F itself. And if I am placing the load anywhere in the span BC, I will get a sagging moment F. But if I place the load here, you can draw the deflection shape. The deflection shape is going to hog in BC, right? So I get a negative moment. That's why this is come below the line. I get a negative moment and so on. So this is a powerful way of drawing the influence line diagram. For example, if the unit load is at G, then whatever I, I draw here is the bending moment at F due to a unit load at G. Okay, this is called the influence line for the bending moment in MF at F. So we'll learn how to do this, but uh, we are doing statically determinate problems. In statically determinate problems, you will not get curved lines you will get straight lines for a simple reason that you uh, have a just rigid structure to begin with and you are giving a release. It becomes a mechanism and mechanism will always deform in, in straight lines. All right. What is the use of the influence line diagram? Let's take this example itself. How is it practically useful? Why are people, why do you learn this in structural analysis? So in design, how is it useful? You are right. Yeah, I am interested in knowing the worst case scenario. 
What is the maximum bending moment that will ever come? I have to design for that moment. What's the minimum moment? In the sense, it could be reverse. It could be hogging. So, how will this diagram help me? Well, these were originally conceived in bridges. In bridges, you have moving loads, actually moving loads. You have uh, vehicles that move and you, they can occupy any span. Only the dead load is constant. So where should I keep my moving loads? Let's say it's a train, uh, so that I get the worst effect. So for example, if I know <coughs> that this is the shape of the influence line diagram, to get the positive moment at F, I should keep my vehicles in, in the spans where I'm getting positive moments. So I should keep them in BC and in DE. Looks like every alternate span. Because if I put loads here, they will only reduce my moment because they are having negative sign. And that's interesting. The other thing to note is, the further you are away from the section, the ordinate drops off. That means the effects are less. The effects are maximum where your load is. If I want to find the minimum value, the, the negative moment at F, then I should not put my live loads here, no live loads here. I should put them here. And I should put them here. So you get some tips on where to keep your loads. It's called pattern loading to get the critical effects, absolute maximum and minimum. Okay, that's one use. The second use is if, if I actually have not the qualitative shape, the actual shape of the influence line diagram, then I can use it to calculate the moment by scaling off the values. Okay, so we'll see these two applications. So these are negative, these are positive. So two purposes, one to identify location of moving loads, live loads, vehicle loads, even in, in buildings you can put live loads, that would result in the maximum values of support reaction and internal force resultants for design purposes. And number two, to enable a quick calculation of these force response functions under any loading configuration. That's the practical use. So let's uh, look at this principle, muller brislaus principle which is actually very easy to derive uh, for statically determinate systems. Let's say uh, I want to find, uh, I want to draw the shape of the influence line diagram. So let's say the load is applied at the location X and it's a unit load. Then all I need to do to find the influence line for the support reaction here is to give a displacement corresponding to this force, which means I release the support and lift it up. So this is then a, a virtual displacement diagram. It will move in a straight line, you can guess that. We've done enough of principle of virtual displacement problems to understand this. Now if you invoke the principle of virtual work, you'll find there's no internal work done because it's all a rigid body movement here. There's only external work being done. The only two, only three forces involved here are RA, RB, and FX. And RB is not going to do any work because it's not moving. So RA into delta A minus one into delta X because it's in opposite direction is the total external virtual work and that must be equal to total internal virtual work which is zero. And so you get something interesting. RA is, RA is the ratio of delta X to delta A. Proved. Okay. Now, if you scale this diagram in such a way that delta A is unity, then this value itself gives you your reaction at A. So if I scale this and make this unity, then whatever I get here is my influence line. Got it? Now this we got from muller brislaus principle. muller brislaus uh, comes from two names. Muller was, was a German and Brislo, uh, Brislo I think was 
from UK and simultaneously they say hit on this idea more or less and so this principle is named after both of them. Okay, then uh, you can write an equation, it's a triangle so you can write it as 1 minus x by L. Now this makes sense, even common sense says that if I shift the load here, the reaction is going to be maximum, it will be 1. If the unit load comes here, my reaction here will be 0, so it's 0. If the load is in the middle, the reaction here will be half, so this will be half and so on. So this makes sense. You can even draw this by using your common sense equilibrium concepts. But this is also a clever way of doing it, invoking muller briz loss principle. If you want the influence line for Ra, this is what we got. If you want for Rb, you lift up B by unity and whatever shape you get will be your influence line diagram. It makes sense and you can write the equation. Is it clear? So you've got a very simple, powerful way of drawing influence line diagram. For just rigid systems, for statically determined systems, they're all straight lines and they're very straightforward, easy to do. So you can write the principle like this. The influence line for any force response function in a structure is given by the deflected shape of the structure resulting from a unit displacement corresponding to the force under consideration. In fact, because uh, in the early days it was difficult to analyze especially statically indeterminate problems, this was a practical way of solving the problem. You actually make a model of it, give a unit displacement or rotation and take measurements and the measurement gives you your influence line value. Okay, it's a ratio. Okay. If you take a continuous beam and you want to find the influence line for reaction net A, all you have to do is the same thing. You lift it up and guess the deflected shape. It's going to be more or less like this. Are you getting it? And it makes sense. If you put a load here, you'll get the worst case. Maximum reaction will go there. And if you put a load at B, C, D or E, you won't get anything. So it's 0, 0, 0, 0. If you put a load here, this will tend to lift up. You can mentally visualize it. And that's why you're, you have an uplift, you have a negative reaction and so on and so forth. So if you had to put live loads, say uniformly distributed live loads, to get the maximum reaction at A, then you should put it on this span. Should not put anything on this span, put it on this span, or every alternate span. If you want to know the minimum load, which means the maximum uplift load, then you have to put it on this span and this span. Don't put any load on these two spans. We are talking of imposed load, live loads. The dead loads will anyway be there. And usually the dead loads are very heavy and they will make sure that the net uplift may not be there. Is it clear? This is only for the live load scenario. Okay. And if you want to draw the bending moment at F, as we saw earlier, you'll have to have a unit rotation and whatever shape you get is your influence line diagram for bending moment at F. Okay. We've seen this. Now let's take a simply supported B. And let's talk of influence lines for shear force. So let's, you have a simply supported beam. If you put a unit load there, uh, from equilibrium itself, you know the reactions. The reaction here will be 1 minus L minus X divided by L. And the reaction here will be X by L. You know that. I'm interested in finding the influence line for shear force at, say, section C. Section C is arbitrarily located, let's say, uh, dividing the span L in the ratio of A to B. What should I do? How will that diagram look? Can you guess? Can you draw? Can you apply muller brislaus principle, which we just learned? Now you need to give a unit displacement corresponding to shear. What does that mean? You have to cut the section at C and you should give a displacement such that the bending moment does not do any work. Only the shear force does work. So you need a vertical separation 
between the left side and the right side of unity and those two lines should be parallel because then only the work done by bending moment gets cancelled out. So what will it look like? Okay, this is the actual shear force diagram for a unit load. If your unit load is there, your shear force diagram will take this shape. But uh, this is how you'll draw it. You'll give a vertical separation here, cut it into two, and make this line and this line parallel, and make this separation equal to one. No, that we are trying to follow the sign convention for shear force, which we discussed in the when we learnt in beams. So it's okay if you do that, but this is consistent with our sign convention. Our sign convention is such that the shear force matches the support reaction at the left end and at the right end the shear force will be negative of the support reaction. Remember that? So, so basically if your location A, A is 0, then whatever line you draw will match the influence line for RA. If your A is L, that means I'm taking a section just next to the support, then whatever line I draw will be the same as the influence line for the support reaction there with a negative sign. So these are my bounding lines. This is the influence line for RA, this is the influence line for RB. Are you getting it? And any section I take, if I take a section here, it will take this shape because this, wherever I cut the ordinate, it will be 1. In other words, I am making a rotation of 1 by L here and 1 by L here. We've done enough of principle of virtual displacements to know that this will always work. Are you getting it? So you can draw many, so let's say the section is here, the section is here, in the middle, section is here, the section. I can keep drawing any section I want. I'll find that my envelope for positive shear force will be this and for negative shear force will be this and I can cut the section anywhere. Wherever I cut, I will get this difference as unity. So if it's this one, I'll draw like this. If it's this one, I'll draw like this. If it's this one, I'll draw like this. Everywhere I follow the principle, the left side goes down, the right side goes up, the vertical separation is unity, and the two sides will be parallel to one another. Okay? So this is how you can draw the shear force uh, influence line diagram. Let's draw the influence line for bending moment. This is my loading diagram. I know the bending moment diagram will be always like this, drawn on the tension side. And uh, I know the values. Value will be always this distance into this distance divided by L. Why? Because support reaction into X will be that moment. Okay. And this, this is going to be the shape. But if I take the location C and I uh, influence line diagram is a graph. You don't need to draw anything on the tension side. It's an influence of a moving load, unit load, on the response function. So it's a graph. Positive is drawn always above the line, baseline. Negative is always drawn below the baseline. So uh, what you need to do, if you use, say, muller brislaus principle, you put a hinge there and you move it up and move it in such a way that the change in rotation will be 1. Then whatever you draw is your... So, in the previous uh, slide, I showed you how to draw the influence line diagram for shear force. There, we had only a vertical separation and we ensured that the two sides were parallel to one another so that the, the virtual work is done only by shear force. Now, you have to make sure the virtual work is done only by bending moment, not by shear force. So you don't bring any vertical separation. Which means at this location, the shear force on the left side does this work, right side does the same work, but with opposite signs. So shear force does not contribute to your external virtual work. Only bending moment contributes. Are you getting it? 
So the change in rotation. So the rules are very simple. This will move up and the rotation should be 1. With this rule alone, you can draw the influence line diagram. The only way you can draw this is by saying that this angle here is actually uh, the sum of this angle and this angle. Can you, can you understand that? If you draw a horizontal line here, the all, this is matching this angle, alternate angle, and this will be matching the other angle. So, uh, and you also know that the answer for the moment here is AB by L, right? So this slope is B by L, this slope is A by L. In fact, you need not know this, but if you knew this, A by L, B by L, it's only when you put, add this plus this, it'll become A plus B by L, which is one. So that's how you draw the influence line diagram for bending moment. And you can use either equilibrium and draw it, or you can invoke Mueller Brislow's principle. Here again, you can draw, so let's say I put my section C, I draw it here, then it'll look like this. If I shift it, I'll draw like that, I'll draw like that. So you'll find this is my envelope, and this will can be shown to have a parabolic structure. And the absolute maximum bending moment that you'll get anywhere in the beam will be in the middle, when the load is absolutely in the middle, and then you know the value A, B by L becomes, A becomes L by 2, B becomes L by 2, so you'll get, or unit load in the middle will, will tell you that half into half it'll be 1 by 4, L by 4, right? So it's good to know the envelope, just like we drew the envelope for the shear force, I'm drawing the envelope for uh, any moment diagram. Now let's take an example. Okay, those are easy problems. In reality, you can have different types of load. You will have concentrated loads, for example, a, a car. You have a locomotive or you, know, you have a crane girder moving on a, a crane moving on a gantry girder. You will have wheels with a separate wheel base, so you have concentrated loads. So if you have one concentrated load or multiple concentrated loads, that's one type of loading. The other type of loading is a distributed load, okay, where you say the too many concentrated loads very closely spaced, like ideally in a track loading, or even in a railway track you can simulate that, so, or an equivalent UDL. So the question asked is, supposing I have not a concentrated load, if I had a concentrated load acting at C, then I know how to draw the influence line diagram for shear force and bending moment. Now the question is, I've got a distributed load and I want to keep it in uh, the most critical location so that I get the maximum bending moment at C. Where should I keep it? So this is my influence line diagram for MC. But my actual loading is a track loading. Where should I position this? So let's say this is C. And this is A1 and this is B1. A1 plus B1 is equal to C. This is the span of the loading. And uh, A and B are these two points. So where should I keep this? arrangement, what should be the ratio of A1 to B1 to get the maximum bending moment at C? Can you tell me? Can you guess? CG of the load should match the? Uh, CG of the bending moment diagram? Bending moment diagram has no weight, so no gravity acts on the bending moment diagram. Load will have CG. This is, so you can do a centroid. So can you give me a, a formula? It will be same as the span is divided. Right. So t tell me what the formula is. G1 by A. Huh? A1 by A must be equal to B1 by B. Right? That's uh, an intuitive guess. 
it makes sense because basically the bending moment here is given by the area that is shaded here. Do you agree it's an area? Why? Because every unit load will have its own value and you have to integrate. This will be in kilonewton per meter. So you need to maximize this area. And this area will be maximum when the cent center of gravity of the load divides the span in the same ratio as the section divides the span. Okay, so this can be proved. I'm not getting into the proof. You can find the support reactions and uh, you can work it out and you can maximize this and you'll end up with the same proof. A1 by A is equal to B1 by B. Okay, so let's skip the proof. When you practice, you don't need to remember any proofs and all. You have to know what to do. And this is what you do. It makes sense. So this is a kind of a small theorem. The bending moment at a particular section in a simply supported beam will be maximum when the load is placed such that the average load on the segment to the left of the section is the same as that on the segment to the right of the section. That is, the section should divide the load in the same ratio as it divides the span. That's a nice way of putting it. But you can also talk of average because what we are saying is A1 divided by A is the average load on this span, on the left side. Total load acting on AC is A1 into W, right? Or Q0. And total load acting on the right side is Q0 into B1 and the average load will be Q0 B1 divided by B. Q0 is constant, you can eliminate it. So A1 by A equal to B1 by B. Okay, so either way you can remember it. All right. Now, I'll go straight to, without getting into the proof, what happens if you have a complicated train of loads acting? Long span bridge and a lot of vehicles are moving on it. But you know the distances because the axle locations are known. The wheel base is known. So let's say you have many loads. What's the rule? Let's not go into the proof. What do you remember? The maximum bending moment at a particular section in a simply supported beam under a train of constant loads occurs when a particular load is located at the section such that when this load crosses over the section, the average load on the segment to the left of the section minus the average load on the right segment changes sign. So here, it will be exactly equal because you had a UDL which can move little by little and you can get that point. Here, it will be a jump. It won't, need not be exactly zero, it can change sign. And uh, where is the absolute maximum? The maximum bending moment under any given constant load which forms part of a train of loads moving across a simply support beam occurs when the mid-span point of the beam, the mid-span point of the beam bisects the distance between the center of gravity of the load system and the given load. Uh, let's just demonstrate this so that it's difficult to remember these theorem, but when we give an example, you'll understand. Let's get a feel for this. This is our loading diagram. If the load is, let's say I have just two loads, P1 and P2. And this is moving from left to right. So P1 will not generate any, any um, bending moment. This is a bending moment diagram when the load is here. When the load goes there, this is a bending moment diagram. When the load goes there, there's a bending moment. Can you feel it? Now, I want to know what's the worst. So the worst happens. Bending moment will always be maximum under one load. Just take a look. It was under this load, not this load. Now it is under this load, not this load. It's under this load. Are you getting it? But which load, where? It's a tricky thing. So this theorem shows this. Okay, the special case is when you have a symmetric span, okay? Then both loads will give you the same moment. Now, I won't get into the proof, but the proof is here. I'll skip the proof. You can go through this in the book in detail. Let's demonstrate it. Draw the influence lines for shear force and bending moment at a section C located one meter from the left support 
of a simply support beam of span AB as shown in the figure. Hence, determine the maximum shear force and maximum moment at the C due to a point load of 50 kN, a distributed load of 10 kN per, per meter of length 3 meters and a truck moving from left to right with a load 50 kN on the front wheels and 200 kN on the rear wheels with a wheel base of 3. That's the previous uh, picture that I showed you. Let's first, the question is shear force and many moment at C. C is given. So that you can draw. This is the influence line for shear force at C. How do you draw this diagram? Remember these two lines are drawn. Left side goes down, right side goes up. The angle is 1 by L. Remember? That's how you draw it. L in this case is 5. So 1 by 5 is 0.2. So this is 0.2 and this is this rotation is 0.2. Okay. So you've got this 0 0.2, 0 0.8. You've got the influence line for shear force. And the units are important. Don't write kilonewton. It's the shear force caused by a unit load. So it's kilonewton per kilonewton. In other words, the, if the load acting is 10 kilonewton, you have to multiply by 10. All right. So this is one thing to do. Now we have three loads. Okay. One is you had a 50 kilonewton load. Case A, obviously you should put it exactly there. The second case was you had a UDL. Wherever the area is maximized, so the area is maximized here, so you should put it there to the right of that section. The third case was you had one load of 200 kilonewton, another 50, you should put the 200 kilonewton bang here to get the worst case. And you can easily calculate, let's not waste time, you can calculate. Uh, you have to get the, the maximum, it doesn't matter which is plus or minus, you can calculate. First case, in this case you've got 40 kilonewton, in this case, uh, how do you use the inflow lines to get this? Well, you just have to get this area and multiply by 10. So this area is average of 0.8 and 0.2 and multiplied by this, the length 3, that's this area. Uh, this area you've got and then multiply by 10, that's all, 15 kilometers. If you want to find the negative, you can, but that's negligible. So. Uh, you write the absolute maximum. The third case, 200 into 0.8 plus 50 into 0.2. That's all you have to do. Okay, 170 kg. It's quite easy. For bending moment, you want it at C, so A, B by L you'll draw. This will be B by L, 4 by 5. A by L is 1 by 5. So you'll write A, B by L is 0.8. You draw this first. Then you've got three cases. First case, you put it bang here to get this. Find out the value. 50 into 0.8, straight away you got 40. Units are kilonewton meter per kilonewton. Ending moment is unit as kilonewton meter and per unit load means per kilonewton. The 10 kilonewton meter you should put in such a way that you maximize this area, right? So by the thumb rule we've learned, if the span, this section divides the span in the ratio of 1 is to 4, you should place your load in such a way. The, the load has a span of, how much was it? 3 meter. So 3 meter should be divided in the ratio of 1 is to 4. So you will find that it is 0.6 to 2.4. Does it make sense? That is how you do it from the previous uh, principle. And then you can just use this diagram and work out. Second case is you take this area, that's the average of 0.32 and 0.8 and this distance is 0.6. That's the small trapezium. That into 10 and then you take this area. This value turns out to be 0.32. So 0.8 plus 0.32 divide, uh, sorry, into 2.4 and the average of that very easy, straightforward calculation. So you are actually using the influence line diagram to get the desired maximum values. This is how you demonstrate it. So you have got some kilonewton meter. The third case, again you will put the maximum load, 200 kilonewton bang here and wherever this comes you should put it. And you know the value here is 0.8, the value here is 0.2, so it is very straightforward. 200 into 0.8 plus 15 to 0.2. Very easy demonstration of what you can do to get the maximum values. 
We'll do just one more problem. Consider a simply supported beam of span 5 meters with a train of loads moving from the left to right. Using influence lines, find the maximum bending moment at a section C. Located 3 meters from the left support. Also find the absolute maximum bending moment and the corresponding equivalent uniformly support distributed load. Let's understand this. First, let's finish the first part of the question. You've got a train of loads which is moving from left to right. And four concentrated loads, the distances are given, axle loads are given, 0.8 meter, 1 meter, 0 0.8 meter, 120 kilonewton is here, 400 there, 150 there, 250 there. And uh, where should you keep this arrangement to get the maximum bending moment at C? What's your guess? How will you do it? If this was a UDL, what would you do? You will uh, just like C divided the uh, span in the ratio 3 is to 2, you will divide what is this length? Uh, 2.6 meters in the same ratio, right? But you can't do that now because you've got constant loads. So you use the same principle average load on the left and average load on the right, wherever it changes sign. So you have to do it step by step. So you say, okay, let, let's say the first load is crossing. If once it crosses over, the load on the left side will be this much. 120 plus 400 plus 150, let's say it's moved, this, this load has come there. Or it's just crossed over and the right side will be 250 by 2. Got it? Just to the, it's shifted to the right. And this value is positive. This value is more than this. Then you put the next load here. When it's crossing over, the right side will be now 250 by 150 divided by 2, average load. And the left side will be 400 plus 120 divided by 3. And it's changed sign. That's a clue. Wherever it's changing sign. So then you put this 150 exactly at C. Very powerful, simple rule to locate it correctly. And you do that. So you can actually check this out. So now you are putting 150 bang here. And uh, once you draw the influence line diagram and you've located all these, you can get these values here. This will always be 2 divided by 5, the rotation here. The rotation here will be 3 by 5, the slope. So 2 by 5 into this distance will give you this value. That distance is 2 meter, 1.2 meters. So the same 2 by 5 multiplied by 1.2 is this value multiplied by 2 is this value multiplied by uh, 3 is this value and so on. And 3, point, 3 by 5 into 1.2 is this value. So you can easily get these values. Then all you need to do is multiply these ordinates with the values of the load. Uh, and you'll find 5 is the common denominator. You can pull it out. So 120 into 1.2 into 2 plus 400 into 2 into 2, plus 150 into 2 into 3, or 3 into 2, and 250 into 1.2 into 3. Are you getting it? And just multiply it out and get this. Now, this has given me the maximum value at C. But when I'm designing this girder, I'm not bothered about the location C. I'm interested in location C if I'm making, for example, a, a stepped section or a tapered section, then if I'm changing the section at C, I have to make sure it's going to be safe there. But if I'm giving a uniform section, I-beam, then I want to know, I want to know where to locate this to get the absolute bending moment in the entire bridge. So the method is this. And very important to know this. First, you find the CG of this load. So if you start from the left, the total load works out to 920x, x bar, if you move from the left. So 920x bar is equal to, if you start from here, 120 into 0 plus 400 into 0 0.8 plus 150 into 1 1.8 plus 250 into 2.6, that must be equal to total load into x bar. You can get x bar. You're, you've got the CG of the load. Is it clear? 
Now the trick is this. The maximum bending moment is always going to occur under one of the loads closest to the CG. Usually the heavier load. So your CG is here. You can plot the CG. And the center line of the beam is here, 2.5. The rule is the CG of the load divides the critical load and the center line equally. It bisects it. Now you can check this load and this load and figure out which is more critical. We are saying that this load is going to be more critical because 400 is heavier than 150. So what you do is, you can check the other one also. 2.5 meters here and X bar is here. Total load is acting there. Then you put this center line in such a way that it bisects this distance equally. So that means you can work out th those values and then it turns out that this is the value from here and this is the value from there. That's all you have to do. And then once you've done that, you, once you know these rotations, you can get the actual values here, here, here and here. And you can write these values in kilonewton meter per kilonewton and then just multiply 120 into this value, 400 into this value, 150 into this value, 250 into this value, 815.8 kilonewton meter. You see the value you got for MC max. So it's wrong to say that the bending moment will always be in the middle of the beam. It won't be. Well, in a hurry, you can calculate at the center, put it in the center, and you'll get some value. It won't be too much way off, but this is the absolute maximum value. And in practice, I have done this many times. Especially in gantry girder designs, you'll have a crane girder with a certain wheel base. You'll have to put it in this way, and it's very easy to do it. Now, this is a little painful. So what, for example, this, this happens in railway tracks, in railway bridges. So who's going to do all this calculation? So the codes like to give you a simple calculation. What do they do? You want to make sure the bridge is safe. So they say, let's replace this whole thing with a UDL on the beam. Equivalent UDL. And if I just put that UDL, I know the formula is WL squared by 8. And uh, though it's not a real loading, it's an imaginary loading. But if I put that loading, I'll be designing with this moment. So that's the concept of the equivalent UDL. It's a very beautiful concept, practically very useful, makes the life of the practicing engineer very easy. So all you have to do is to find the equivalent UDL. Q equivalent L squared by 8 is this value. Find out Q equivalent. And then play safe. All the codes play a little safe. They'll multiply this. There'll be a dynamic effect. So they probably multiply this by 25% or 50%. Or unless they give you a separate impact factor to take care of. This is how you find equivalent UDL and makes your life easy. The only shortcoming of this is, can you tell me? I'm designing a B. And in the standard, I choose your uh, equivalent UDL based on not the current traffic, but the kind of overloads that can happen and the future you know, loads that can come. I play safe and give you an equivalent UDL. What, so that's very easy for the practicing engineer to work with. I don't need to look at all these axle loads. I'll just work with one UDL. In trains, in, in railway code, it's like that. Life is easy. But there's something you need to check for and worry about. Shear, the equivalent load for maximum shear is different from the equivalent load for maximum bending moment. But unless uh, that value of equal load for sure is lower than this value, then you don't care. Uh, but then you may be a little over conservative. So remember that. Uh, 
okay, now we come to more interesting problems. You have a beam with overhangs. Overhang here, overhang there. Okay. Using influence lines. Okay, so here you've, you're given the loads. They're located here. Can you use influence lines and get the reaction at C? The bending moment at E and the shear force at E. Okay, here I'm not moving the loads. More lo I'm instead of doing an equilibrium calculation, I'm going to you draw influence front lines and get these answers. It's different. It's a problem to test your understanding of drawing influence lines. I can actually get these answers by doing static equilibrium. I can easily find the reaction at C by invoking two equations of equilibrium, sigma Fy equal to zero. And taking moments about B, I can find. Taking moments about B, I can get this answer. Right? And the bending moment at E, I can cut, cut a section here. After I find this reaction, I can find the moment here. And the shear force at E also I can find. Uh, why don't you do that first? So that we know the answers beforehand. We won't draw an influence line diagram. We'll just, can you tell me what the reaction at C will be for this loading? This is the first topic we did, finding support reactions in statically determinate beam. All you need to do is to take moments about here, so you eliminate the reaction at B. RC into 4 meters is equal to, you do your calculations. Give me the answer. Give me three answers before we... Uh, get the same answers drawing influence line diagram. We are finding support reactions RC into taking moments about B equal to 0 RC into 4 meters that's my anti-clockwise moment. The other anti-clockwise moment will be 20 into RCM assuming acting upwards. Okay, 20 into 2 meters. This must be equal to 100 into how much? Two meters. And what is that total load? 50. 10 into 1 point. You can write 10 into 1.5, nothing wrong. And the CG of it will be at what distance from? It will be 4 plus, well, you can do that. 4 plus 1.5 by 2. Solve this and tell me what is the answer coming. You got your calculators here? I'm just doing it for fun so that let's, I don't know. You know. Yeah? Sorry? One more person should confirm. 57? Exactly. 0.80. 8.1 kilo newton. Okay. So we've got RC. Now we want the bending moment at E. To get the bending moment at E, all you need to do is to just isolate that free body. And you've got uh, you've got reaction here, which is 57.81 kilo newton. You've got a UDL here. which uh, you can replace by a concentrated load whose value is 15. And this is E. And this location is C. And this is D. 
And uh, let's assume that the moment there is sagging, and you want to find the shear force at E. So let's assume that the shear force is, is positive. So what's the rule for positive shear force? Left side down is positive, right side up is positive. So this is my shear force at E. This is my moment at E, sagging. So what is my shear force at E? SE will be, tell me, it will be plus or minus? Plus or minus? It will be minus. It will be 15 minus 57.81. How much is this? Minus 42. 0.81 kilonewton. This is what we are guessing. This is the answer. We will normally do that. What is my moment at E? It will be 57.81 into, what is this distance? Mm. Are you sure? 2.4 minus 4 is 1.6 meter. This is 1.6 meters. So into 1.6. And uh, this distance will be so minus 15 into 1.6 plus 0.75, right? How much is this? Huh? 50? Plus sagging moment, 57.2. 246 will round off. This is what we would normally have done. But here it's just an exercise for you to draw inference line diagram. So how do you draw the inference line diagram? for a simply supported beam with over, overhangs. Can you draw the inference line for RC? What will it look like, reaction at C? What should you do? Just lift it up. And what will you get? A straight line. You get like that. And do the calculation. First of all, just check, is it matching? Yes, it's matching, so you can Okay, but we are not doing any equilibrium, we are using only the inference line diagram. You see, uh, this 20, see, let's draw this diagram. You are drawing this diagram so that you get a unit movement at C, which means the slope of this line is 1 divided by 4, which means the value here will be this 2. So it's half of 1, it's 0 0.5, and under the load it's 0 0.5, and here it will be 5.5 divided by 4, it's 1.375. This is how you write the inference line for RC. Is it clear? And after you get this simple calculation, 20 into minus 0.5, 100 into plus 0.5, and this quantity, 10 into this area. This area is 1 plus 1.375 divided by 2 into 1.5. Does it make sense? So this is the using the inference line diagram, getting the same answer. But at least you drew this. Sometimes the question is only draw the inference line diagram. Now the next question is draw the inference line diagram for the bending moment at E. What should you do? Imagine there's a hinge there and you lift it up so that this side comes down like that and this side comes down like that, right? With a unit rotation. So that's what you do. When you do this, like, see, you draw for the simply support beam and just extend the line. So this line will always be this distance divided by the span. So it's 1.6 by 4 is this rotation, and this is 2.4 by 4, right? And using this angle and this distance, you can get this value. Using this angle and this distance, you can get this value. So you've got all the values where the loads are acting. 
do the next calculation. It gets more interesting. Consider the simply supported beam with overhangs A, B, C, D shown in the figure. Same, uh, similar problem. Instead of the given loading, assume a uniformly distributed dead load of 10 kN per meter and live loads capable of having any length. So you can have a train of any length having a magnitude of 20 kN per meter. Using appropriate influence lines, find the design values of maximum bending moments in the beam. This I want you to do on your own right now, without any help. E is mid-span. So you've got dead load, you have no choice. Dead load will be acting everywhere. Live load, you should put in such a way that you get maximum sag. I want to know what is the design moment on this B at E. You have to give me two values, absolute maximum and minimum. So how do we start? What do we begin with? We draw the influence line diagram for bending moment at E, right? What will it look like? Whatever you do for the simply supported, you just have to extend. So it's going to look like this. The value here is AB by 4, L by 4. 4 by 4 is 1. 2 by 4 is 0 0.5, so 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And then this is the influence line for the bending moment at E. Yes or no? Where should I put the dead load? Everywhere, I have no choice. Where should I put the live load for maximum sagging moment? I should put it only on BC. Where should I put it for minimum sagging moment, possible hogging moment? I should put it on the two overhangs. Make sense? That's all you do. So sagging moment, you, you are putting Okay, in the middle region, you'll put both dead load and live load. So this triangle, you multiply by 20 plus 10. Okay, 20 plus 10 into 4 into 1 divided by 2. Okay, that takes care of this triangle. Right? In these two, you should put only dead load, no live load. So take these two areas. Okay, 1 into 2 into 10, 10 is dead load, and 0.75 into 1.5 into 10 divided by 2. So you get some answer here. This is maximum sagging moment. If you want to find the maximum negative moment, what should you do? Ah, this is interesting. This is anywhere in the beam. So here you are saying the maximum sagging moment will always be in the middle. And the maximum hogging moment will always be in which support will it be? This support or this support? B. The idea that I'm going to put an I-beam there and I'm, the I-beam will have the same moment capacity at all locations. I want to find how much I should put. So the moment will be maximum here. So how do I get the maximum moment? The influence line diagram for maximum moment here, how do I get? Remember, I should put a hinge there. And I should have a unit rotation. But I should not violate this boundary condition. It must stay. So the only way I can do it is put a hinge there and lower this part. That's only kinematically admissible. That's how I do it. I rotate it by one. Keep this horizontal. And one into this distance is two. So two kilonewton meter per meter. That's all. What should I do? I should put my maximum moment here. I, I don't, whatever I put here, I'm going to multiply by zero, only the overhang moment. So it's a very straightforward calculation. You don't need the influence line diagram. You can use your common sense. Say put, it's a cantilever. I put the worst effect there. You get the answer. Is it clear? So never lose your common sense. You should know the, the correct way to do it. And move ahead. Any questions so far? All right then we'll have some fun, okay? Draw the influence lines for RA and MA. 
Are draw. Okay, so we'll have somebody coming to the board and drawing. What are the rules for drawing the influence line diagram by Mueller Brislaw's principle? What should you do? Obviously, you have to lift up by unity, but you have to make sure that there's no rotation. So there's only one way you can draw. Like this. Now you pause and think, does it make sense? Does it make sense? Of course it makes sense. Wherever I put my unit load, the reaction here will always be 1. So it makes absolute sense. What is the meaning of the infant line diagram? If I put a unit load here, this ordinate is my reaction here. If I put 1 there, I'll get 1 here. So it makes sense. Can you draw for MA? Now what should you do? You should now not move it in terms of translation, but only rotate it. Rotate it by 1. So this is going to be a hugging moment, not a sagging moment typically. So you can put it down. And what will you get? Where will the maximum value be? At B, yeah. That's it. You rotate this by unity, so 1 into L will be L will be the unit here. Right? Small rotation. It doesn't make sense? Absolute sense. If I put the load here, the moment that I get here is 0. The worst moment I get when I put it at the free end. And it's linearly varying. See, Mueller-Brizos principle is so powerful, and, but you should always check with your common sense. You're drawing this using the right brain, but you're confirming it using the left brain. That's how it works. Next one. Can you draw the influence line for shear force at C? Ah, that's interesting. What's the normal rule? You cut it, you have a vertical separation, you make sure the left and right remain parallel. And usually the, right, the left goes down and the right goes up, or the right should be relatively up compared to the left. How will you draw it? How will you draw it? This one I would like someone to come to the board and draw. So far easy. This one is a little thinking. Come to the board and we'll help you. Come. Don't worry. What are the rules for shear force? Remember whenever you cut a section, both shear force and bending moment you expose. You must make sure bending moment does not do any work. Only shear force does work. No rotation. No rotation. No, no. So that was a mistake he did there. Let's hope he does it correctly on the board. Yeah, you can. When you draw influence line diagram, don't show support. It's just a graph, OK? Now you draw below that. Draw the influence line below that. Okay, this is what we normally do for simply support beam. You've done a, okay, parallel. You've done a carryover effect. Now you tell me, is it right yourself? First, self-criticism. What have you violated here? Free. Free, so there's no need for it to be here. Some other violation you did here. What is this? Oh, here it's fixed. So now you rub it and do it fresh. That's how you should check it. See, you yourself know that you're violating. Your right brain should not, you do it. Let's say I give you a plank of wood and it fixed there. I give you a, a hacksaw blade, you cut it, then you do that. You'll never be able to rotate at the fixed end. It's stuck on the wall. Now you tell me. You understand, I have a plank here, it is fixed here. And you cut off here, now you can do whatever you want. This part is fixed. You can't rotate it. This can't. No, okay, but why did you... What is the requirement? You said the left side and right side should remain? Ah, ah. You can use a duster. 
There you are. See, that's it. This is the, the thinking process 100% correct. So he did all possible combinations. Yeah. But this is correct. Okay. Check. See. First violation, no, it's okay. Leave one, yeah. First violation you did was because uh, you tried to repeat what we did for simply supported. No, there this had to come back here. And there this could rotate. Here this can't rotate. And there's no need for this to come back. And the only way you can draw it by having these two parallel is the right support will go up by you. And does it make sense? Let's see. In a cantilever, if you apply a unit load, thank you. If you apply a unit load anywhere in BC, the shear force here at C will be 1. But if you apply a unit load here, it will go only to this region. This part will remain unaffected. So that's why the shear force is 0. Everywhere it should make sense. So you see, because we learnt principle of virtual displacements in the early stages, it's become easy for us. This was a tricky question which most people bungle, and you bungle, but you brought in self-correction. All right, very good. Next one. Can you draw influence line for bending moment at C? And we'll stop with that. Bending moment at C. Here, what are the rules of engagement? Unit rotation, but no separation. And remember, don't violate this boundary condition. And is it sagging moment or hugging moment? If it's hogging, then you should have negative. What will it look like? Yeah, that's it. Does it make sense? The maximum moment will be when the unit load is applied there and you can. So this is, can, these are the kind of questions you can expect. Uh, they're very easy actually. And then you can put any loading and get the answer. Does it make sense? If you put a load here, only the region to the left will get affected in terms of shear force and bending. The right region will be totally free. Does it make sense? Okay, we'll stop here since we've reached time. We'll continue. Uh, tomorrow we don't have a class, but next Monday we'll. Thank you. <laughs>